Ecologists now recognize that biological diversity, the richness of species together, provides essential benefits in an intricate web. This biological world, inherently phenomenal, offers here an underwater story of a unique genetic permutation. The Upper Rogue River in southern Oregon is an extraordinary place. Water flows off the northern flanks of ancient Mount Mazama, an enormous volcano that erupted 7,000 years ago, leaving an iconic caldera filled with water and designated as one of America's first national parks. Crater Lake dramatically dots the Cascade Mountain Range with Hood and Rainier to the north, Shasta and Tahoe to the south. These are some of the wildest lands remaining anywhere. Bear, cougar, and elk still roam through these giant forests with complex soils, interdependent ecosystems, and cold, clear, fresh waters tumbling dynamically through rugged gorges. These highly oxygenated waters are home to a very unusual phenomenon. This is where the underwater mushroom lives. Mushrooms grow almost everywhere. From rainforest to deserts, from the equator to near each pole, in many shapes, colors, and sizes, and mostly unseen. But while mushrooms are nearly ubiquitous, because they must respire, and because they require air for spore dispersal, most textbooks explain that mushrooms don't grow underwater. But recently, this all changed. On a hot July afternoon in 2005, hydrologist Robert Coffin was relaxing in the cool waters of the Upper Rogue River. Even though I'm, I work often in streams, I was in goof-off mode. It was just my wife Simone and me, and we were up here on a family outing. We had our lawn chairs stretched out over here, and this, this is beautiful. As he gazed at the aquatic vegetation and patterns of colorful cobble, he saw something strange, something he had never seen before. Little brown mushrooms growing underwater. And I was wading around like this, nice and clear, enjoying the day. And I looked down and I saw mushrooms growing underwater. And I knew enough, just enough, so that tickled me. And I went, you know, that's unusual. I don't know how unusual yet, but that's unusual. So the next day I came up with a camera and got a little more serious and took some cheap, oh, you know, one of those disposable cameras and I took the first underwater, the first photographs of gilled underwater mushrooms that we know of and that's what was so fun. And as I looked at the photographs, once they were developed, because as you know, Jonathan, you don't really see what they look like until you get underwater and get the, the ripples and the sun dappled away. And then is when you really see how special they are. Robert spent the next two years contacting professional mycologists, but it was such a remote location and professional assumption was that mushrooms don't grow underwater. Two years later, in 2007, Robert sent an email to Darlene Southworth, an emeritus professor of biology at Southern Oregon University. At the time, I was working with Dr. Southworth as a research assistant and laboratory technician, training students studying oak woodlands, truffles, and mycorrhizal ecology. Together, we had collected and identified hundreds of fungi. We were using molecular techniques, which means we were sequencing DNA from the fungi we collected and comparing genetic signatures with thousands of fungi from around the world. These ultra-modern methods turned out to be essential for
for determining the identity of the underwater mushroom that Robert had observed. It should be noted that there are a handful of fungi known to grow at least partially underwater. But all of these are cup fungi in the group Ascomycetes, which includes yeasts, truffles, and morels, rubbery fungi that form their spores in sac-like cells which are called acai. The underwater mushrooms that Robert saw were gilled mushrooms in the group Basidiomycetes, which includes the common white button mushroom found at most grocery markets or on a slice of pizza. In fact, these were relatively nondescript, boring, little brown mushrooms, LBMs, that grow in diverse habitats from lawns to parks to stream sides and forests, and it was relatively simple to assign them to the genus Satharella because of their overall morphology or shape. But then the problem with Satharella was that uh, it has a great many species, they all look pretty much alike. It's an archetypical little brown mushroom with relatively few characters uh, to the eye and only a few more to the microscope. In fact, the genus Satharella, which literally means fragile little mushroom, is an enormous group with over 400 species in North America alone. Author David Aurora explains humorously, Few fleshy fungi have less to offer the average mushroom hunter, not to mention the average human being, than the satharellas. They constitute an immense, monotonous, and metagrobalizing multitude of dull, whitish, buff, grayish, or brownish mushrooms with a fragile stem, fragile flesh, and purple-brown to blackish spores. To describe this vexing mushroom group, Aurora resuscitated the adjective metagrobalizing defined emphatically in his glossary as puzzling, bewildering, confounding, confusing, perplexing. Which arguably makes Satharella representative of mycology in general. In fact, most mycologists would simply identify them as LBMs and move on. Unfortunately, we did not have that luxury. We needed to figure out the specific identity of this peculiar Satharella. In don't know where this is going to go, but let's pursue it and let's find out. And that's where I found guys like you to help me on the mycology side. Even with modern DNA techniques, it required over two years of research, including examining hundreds of collections from North America and drafting numerous manuscript revisions to satisfy the reasonably skeptical scientific journal editors. The process affirmed the strength of the peer review method and of modern science in general, which allows for constantly updating its understanding as new information becomes available. Well, part of what's so truly remarkable about this little brown mushroom fruiting underwater is the fact that the mushroom needs to breathe. It needs to respire. And how is it getting oxygen underwater? One hypothesis is that in addition to buoyantly stabilizing the mushroom underwater, the large gas bubble trapped under the mushroom cap provides a chamber for spores to eject into and functions as a kind of external lung, facilitating the diffusion of oxygen in from the cold, highly oxygenated river. Now, the big problem for this mushroom also is that its spores would just all flow downstream to the ocean, and that's not a long-term viable proposition. It needs to be able to recolonize suitable habitat in this same area as well as potentially upstream. And what functions to do that appears to be these aquatic insect larvae. So far, three species of aquatic insect larvae have been observed grazing and filter feeding on the underwater satharella. So why should we care about Satharella aquatica? I mean, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon, and it's uh, another beautiful story in the grand web of nature that we're a part of. But also, Satharella may, in fact, have certain properties that could be beneficial, such as enzymes that degrade hydrocarbons and nitrogen and other elements 
in saturated conditions. So if you think of an oil spill or a toxic spill in a freshwater uh, system, Satharella aquatica could be used to help clean that up, or the enzymes that Satharella aquatica produces could be um, used in that process. Still, after all the analytical work to determine the identity of this new mushroom, now called Satharella aquatica, a deep mystery remains regarding this rare and beautiful phenomenon. Like a miniature fungal version of the mammalian whale whose ancestors returned to the sea, what mutations occurred that allow Satharella aquatica to grow and fruit underwater? Can we read the pattern of genetic adaptations in its DNA script? Does the underwater mushroom produce unique enzymes or other proteins or chemicals? How do these mushrooms spread their spores and reproduce? How recently did this phenomenon evolve? Is it a response, an indicator of some sort? We are only beginning to explore this remarkable story. But when all is said and done, is this a story about an underwater mushroom? Or is this a story of an amazing river, cold and oxygenated, swirling with volcanic sediments, conducive to supporting an otherwise terrestrial organism, like the amniotic fluid of the planet, full of plasmic possibilities, representing the fertile miracle of biological life on this rotating rock, light years away from anything else like it. This is a reminder to appreciate these precious qualities. This is also a story about keeping our minds open, questioning seemingly solid assumptions. If a fragile little brown mushroom can grow and fruit underwater in the cold turbulence of the upper Rogue River, what else is possible?